Yes, test one, two. Testing, we're hoping people at home can hear. We're grateful you're listening in. Test one, two, and am I close enough to the mic here? And we hope we're ready to start. You just let me know when, when to begin. Okay, we are live here at First Presbyterian Church. Thank you to all those that are at home watching over the week. We know not everybody can watch today because there's some Facebook uh, problems with getting this shifted on. But if you're at the church website, as we hope you are, we're glad you're joining us. And if you're watching this uh, at any time throughout the time, we're glad you're here. Uh, First Presbyterian, as most Presbyterians like to take adult ed seriously, And uh, with COVID, it's been a little difficult, but we're glad many people are able to watch online. And we're glad for folks that are here in the room in the chapel today, uh, socially distanced as we are. (laughs) Nice to see you guys. Uh, Today is a special day in First Presbyterian Church York's history because our uh, co-pastor Allison Ballou is uh, at the end of her call here and is moving on to a church in Lancaster. And so there'll be a big service at 10, uh, just one service. We usually have more than one, but just one big service today. Uh, for Allison's last sermon, and we miss her. She would often be in the room here, and uh, we're going to miss Allison a lot. So pray for our church as we seek a new uh, co-pastor, uh, and we're, we're just grateful for people that are here. My name is Byron Borger, and as you may know, we have had this a couple of week class with Allison and my daughter Stephanie on a Presbyterian document that is called the Confession of 1967. The little tiny bit of background of that document was that, you know, the, the horrific uh, question of slavery and the Civil War broke Presbyterians apart in the 1800s, and uh, they never really united. There were Southern Presbyterians and Northern Presbyterians, both mostly formed around issues of slavery in the, in the Civil War. And by the middle of the 20th century, there were conversations about how this was just such a wrong thing and they needed to repent of this division and reunite, which they began to do for a while. We were even called United Presbyterians. We're now called the Presbyterian Church USA, but that name didn't happen until the 1980s. Well, in the, in the uh, 18 and early 1900s, there was one main document that the Presbyterians, beside the Bible, of course, used, and it was called the Westminster Confession of Faith. Westminster Confession, Westminster Catechism. And that was the only document that was sort of the guiding principle of Presbyterianism. And we decided in the 1950s that they needed to add other ones, like the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, the Scots Confession, the Helvetica Confession, these fabulous confessional documents that were written during the time of the Reformation and other times as well. And they decided to write a new one in the middle of that. And it took them years to do it, from the early 60s until about 67. It was a team of theologians uh, led by a guy from Princeton Seminary, a dear friend of mine, a Christian educator at Hershey, at a Presbyterian church in Hershey, met with this guy once a week when she was a student at Princeton to talk about the confessions. And uh, he helped do, uh, as the primary writer of the Confession of 67. And so that was published in 1967 as a new statement of faith as they created a new uh, book of confession, new in those years, adding more than just the Westminster and uniting the Northern Presbyterians and the Southern Presbyterians. So there was a lot going on in the church, in the denomination, as they were reuniting, as they were creating a book of confession, as they wanted to honor these older statements of faith that we stand on, certainly the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed for starters, other ones during the time of the Reformation, and then a fresh new one was subsequently another new one written in 1980. But the 67 one was the one we've been studying the last couple of weeks, and it's in our Book of Confession, part of our Constitution. And Stephanie and Pastor Allison did a good job walking us through that. 
One of the things that they say about that document, if you tuned in any of the last couple of weeks online or those that were here in the room, knew that one of the major themes of the Confession of 67 was reconciliation. In fact, in the Book of Confession, they have this little introduction to it, and here's just one phrase they say. Modestly titled, the Confession of 1967 is built around a single passage of Scripture. In Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself. That's from 2 Corinthians 5, verse 19. It explains the first section, God's work of reconciliation, is divided into three parts. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit. The second section about the, the ministry of reconciliation has two parts. The mission and the equipment of the church. And the last part, the fulfillment of reconciliation, affirms the church's hope in God's ultimate triumph. So that's the document we've been studying the last couple of weeks, this Confession of 67, or what some church nerds call C-67. You hear Stephanie sometimes say C-67, Confession of 67, and that it is built around the theme of reconciliation. Reconciliation with God, with the mission of the church, and the final hope of the reconciliation of the world. So that's what we've been doing. Here's how it ends. They were running out of time last week, and they did a beautiful ending, but I thought I would just start where they ended. This is the last part of C-67 in the fulfillment of God's hope of reconciliation. It says here, God's redeeming work in Jesus Christ embraces the whole of man's life. 67 it may have been, but they were still not using inclusive language yet, of humans, kinds, uh, full life, social and cultural, economic and political, scientific and technological, individual and corporate. It includes humankind's natural environment, the creation, as exploited and despoiled by sin. It is the will of God that his purpose for human life shall be fulfilled under the rule of Christ and all evil banished from his creation. It goes on and says, Biblical visions and images of the rule of Christ, such as a heavenly city, a father's house, a new heaven and a new earth, a marriage feast, an unending day, they all culminate in this image of the kingdom of God. The kingdom represents the triumph of God over all that resists his will and disrupts his creation. Already, God's reign is present as a ferment in the world, stirring hope in men and women and preparing the world to receive its ultimate judgment and redemption. I know they liked last week this line, with an urgency born of this hope, the church applies itself to present tasks and strives for a better world. It does not identify limited progress with the kingdom of God on earth. In other words, we don't build the kingdom. You can't say any good social change that that's really the full kingdom of God. We don't identify our limited progress with the kingdom of God, nor does it despair in the face of disappointment and social defeat. Rather, in steadfast hope, the church looks beyond all partial achievement to the final triumph of God. That's kind of neat, isn't it? I think it's what we might call a robust public theology. I like that phrase. It's a public theology that counts for all of life, personal and corporate, social and cultural, scientific and political, economic, business, science, all the spheres of life, all the good creation, in fact, the creation itself. Um, polluted as it is, is longing and part of this dream of God's healing hope, this banquet feast that is the ultimate healing of the reign of God that will someday banish all evil from creation. So it is an urgency born of this hope that we start getting involved in full mission, not just church mission of planting churches and leading religious services, as some have greatly done in missionary work, but in all sorts of social change and social reform and cultural change. So that is some of what this document led us to. So the Christian Ed Committee said, well, what do you do to follow that up? Where do we go next? We've done some things on contemplative spirituality during Lent, the very private, personal 
meditation and stuff. We've done some things on uh, Bible study and so forth. We thought, well, why don't we just carry this theme of social change and social reform and God's transforming power and ultimate hope? If, if we're supposed to be urgent, well, let's keep talking about that a little bit. So then we decided, well, what if we, rather than sort of just scold people for not being active enough in the world or just, you know, emphasize uh, why we need to change the world, we all know that, why don't we lift up stories of people that are doing that? So the Sunday school class here for the next month is going to be mostly storytelling, and we have a whole lot of guests lined up. We're still juggling a couple of dates to make that happen, but we have some real live guests and some Zoom uh, video guests that are going to be uh, sort of profiles, if you will, of, of being agents of reconciliation. Um, you remember John Kennedy years ago, had, had so many years ago, had a book called Profiles in Courage, and they were stories of bravery and so forth. Well, we want to offer profiles of uh, not even necessarily Presbyterian, but of Christian people who are uh, agents of God's reconciliation. So I'll later close with a little story, if we have time, of telling you about somebody I admired. Uh, but then uh, we have, uh, oh, geez, a guy that has gone into war zones as an, uh, as, a, as an agent of God's peacemaking. He's had more bullets fired at him than anybody I know, Rick Polanis. Uh, we have an African-American uh, theologian from here in York um, who is a theologian in residence over at Trinity UCC, has been doing some work on uh, prison reform and criminology and mass incarceration, and he's going to talk about some reconciliation there. Someone in our church know Delma Rivera, Rivera, Rivera. Uh, Delma's father started the Spanish American Center, the Hispanic American Center here in York as a first Presbyterian member and uh, the first Latino doctor in, uh, in York. Um, next week, we're going to have Ken Hickman here, who's going to tell the story of his wife's involvement in peacemaking through a story that some of us know a little bit about from years ago when a former pastor was in uh, a peacemaking trip to Russia, and a poor Russian woman gave him a peace candle to light for peace, which has been on our communion table for years, uh, and then Gene started sending them to other Presbyterian churches all over the world. So Ken is going to tell the story of our peacemaking work um, so we have a number of interesting stories we're going to hold up as profiles of agents of reconciliation that I hope will be kind of inspiring and fun. Sometimes in the Bible they give you direct teaching, but most often it's a story. And sometimes the Apostle Paul, when he was writing letters to people, said, uh, look at what I do and do what I do. Follow me and as I follow Jesus. And so we're all sort of following Jesus, and we need models and mentors, guides and examples, and not just didactic teaching. And in fact, parenthetically, one of the things we've talked about here at First Pres in our Christian Ed program for quite a number of years now, it seems, we've been quoting like this Jamie Smith book called You Are What You Love, which says that education, Christian transformation, is not primarily just new content in the head, giving us more data and confessions and theology and Bible verses, but it's a transformation of the heart, and we get that mostly by imagining things newly, by being inspired to have new imaginations, new possibilities, new worldviews, new lenses to see things differently. And so as we see things differently, our heart gets on fire for different things. In other words, we love and we care about different stuff. Our affections and what we give ourselves to, we are what we love, not just what we think. And so we think holding up some stories and examples and allowing different people to tell their own inspiring stories of agents of reconciliation might help us love and care for God's kingdom rather than just giving us more content about it. Does that make sense? Um, stories can work. Examples and models can inspire us and show us real life flesh and blood people that are in their own fallen way with their own uh, sins and foibles but still are heroic people doing good work around being agents of transformation. And so that idea of mentors and models as an example of how pedagogy, how Christian education and formation can happen is what we're going to play with over the next couple of weeks. And so we'll have some uh, guests, we'll have some Zoom conversations, and we'll have some incredible uh, profiles of reconciliation. I'm, I'm excited, and one or two of these people are just remarkable folks. They have stories you'll never forget. Um, so that's what we're going to do. Uh, but for today, of course, 
Uh, we, we're, we don't have quite as much time as we sometimes might because we, again, we have this big uh, celebration of Allison's sermon uh, coming up and, uh, and the change of time here and all. So we're, we're just gonna today, after all that, give a few biblical foundations for what we're about to do for this Agents of Transformation or Agents of Reconciliation uh, series of examples and stories I got to lay the biblical foundation. They call me in sometimes when we just want to lay the foundation, review where we've been, talk about C67, as we call it, and now give some Bible stuff. Because as good as that study was uh, over the last couple of weeks, we didn't have time to unpack Bible verses. So I'm going to just throw out a bunch of Bible verses so we are clear that there's a biblical foundation for this agents of reconciliation and social change stuff. And then the next coming weeks are all going to be just stories and examples and models and profiles in, not profiles, in courage, as Kennedy called it, but profiles of reconcil reconciliation. Well, let's start with this theme of reconciliation. I gave, read that great quote from Confession 67, uh, and again, even the introduction that said the whole document is built around reconciliation. I'm going to just highlight a couple of verses. And uh, if we had more time and we're in a small group, I'd invite everybody to read and different folks and different translations the way we do they, like on our Wednesday night Bible study. But since we're sort of a, a doing this live on Facebook and stuff, I'll just read the text myself. But here's a handful of verses that inspire us to think about reconciliation as a major theme of, of, of Christian faith. And if anybody wants to chime in or share other verses or have comments or questions, don't hesitate to, to give a shout here. That mic picks up everything. Here's the beginning of Romans 5. This is a famous verse, actually. Therefore, there's been a lot of theological talk Paul is doing there under the boot heel of the empire, no less, but he's talking about grace and love and God's goodness. And he says, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. This is huge for any Christian, certainly the Protestant tradition, and certainly Presbyterians hang out on this verse, Romans 5, that justification, we are made right with God, through our faith, not through something we do, but through just God's willingness to, to offer love to us, and, and through our faith we trust it, or through our reception we, we trust that, we receive that, and therefore we're given peace with God. So we want to start, as this document did, as you saw from the last couple of weeks, that peacemaking in the world and reconciliation and social transformation, that last great paragraph that I just read, that all starts with the notion of peace with God that we can have peace with creation, with others, with self, with institutions, with cultures. We can help build signposts pointing towards God's redeeming kingdom on earth if we start with the peace that God gives us as people that happens through faith. We are justified through faith and given peace or reconciliation with God. There's a theological word, atonement. Sometimes when I used to teach a confirmation class here, I would tell the kids, what it simply means is break down that word, at one meant. We have one with God. We were alienated, and now we're not. We, we were separated, and now we have peace. We were angry, but now we're reconciled. The idea that God loves us, and we've sort of turned our back on him, and now we're reconciled. We have at one mint again. So this notion of social peace and transformation, shalom in the world, and these profiles we're going to look at, start with this idea that God gives us peace. And so when we talk about peacemakers, it doesn't just mean being anti-war, for instance. It also starts with this very idea that we have peace with God. Here's how Paul fleshes it out then a couple of verses later. In 5 verse 10, he says, For while we were yet God's enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. So God's life and death of Jesus and his resurrection give us reconciliation. That word reconciliation is twice in that one verse if we were his enemies. It all starts with us sort of being God's enemies. We're mad at him. That's the human condition. We rebel against our creator. It just is. Most of us know that. And it causes all kinds of problems. But the answer is, is that even while we were yet at God's enemies, he goes to the cross, brings us new life and reconciliation. Make sense? So we start with this robust view of reconciliation with God, at one with God, which is a gift of his peace, his doing. This is what God's about, pouring out God's own love on his creation and giving us this kind of reconciliation. Romans 5 is a great chapter. Here's one that the 
that the document that I just read, I, I said it was sort of modestly based on one verse. Uh, that one verse is Ephesians 2, I think, or at least one of the places it sure sounds like it's from Ephesians 2. Again, another one of these same kind of uh, themes. Uh, I'll start, I guess, in verse, uh, verse 15. I'll start at verse 14. For he, meaning God, for God himself is our peace. Now here Paul's talking about uh, Jews and Gentiles being at each other's throats in the early church. Uh, and he says, now, Christ is our peace who made both groups, he's talking about Jews and Gentiles there, uh, religious and non-religious or, or uh, people that are part of the covenant and outsiders. He made them both into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by a Abolishing in his own flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandment contained in ordinances, that in himself he might make the two into one new man, one new person, one new being, thus establishing peace, and that he might reconcile both in one body to God through his cross, having put to death this enmity. So there's enmity. What's enmity mean? Like anger, anger conflict, conflict, bitterness. Oh, yeah, bitterness, hatred. There's two camps, and they're at each other's throats. There's enmity, and God's going to put to death. It doesn't even say only just our sin, but this very enmity, this very social reality of brokenness. I mean, just think of apartheid in South Africa or, or think about American racial discrimination, particularly, I mean, even now, but particularly in the Jim Crow South, say, two complete entrances to two complete, you know, such enmity between two groups. That enmity is what's going to be put to death, and the resulting fruit is reconciliation, oneness between two groups. Now, granted, this is about Jews and Gentiles in the church becoming one member of the body of Christ as mutual following Jesus. Paul later says something like this, that in Christ now, there's no men or women, Jews or Gentiles, slaves or free, rich or poor. We're all together in this, and we're one. Our identity is no longer primarily about the things that keep us apart, but the unity that he brings, and those no longer even. Uh, and think of, again, a culture. He said this in a culture where men were considered much more important than women in the Greco-Roman world. Uh, uh, slave and free, my goodness, talk about a revolutionary transformation of culture by just saying slaves and frees are one. Slaves and free people are one in the church because God has brought the two together. The dividing wall, it says, is destroyed. So reconciliation is not just sort of feeling a nice kind of, oh, can't we all just get along? But it's actually the social structure of enmity that has dividing walls and those walls coming down and people that were once distant being brought close together. I think this is just a transformational verse about unity in the church, but the implication that this is for the world, that the witness of the church is how the world is supposed to look. And we model that, this unity and oneness. And so again, these profiles and reconciliation that we're going to offer over the next month here in, in Sunday school in adult ed, are not just people that are nice that learn to get along with somebody that bugged them. Although that's an important practice, too. Maybe we'll have one of those. Just somebody that learned to get along with somebody that's a sandpaper person, as some are called. Uh, don't we all need to just get along with people that rub us the wrong way? Um, we all have some of those. But no, this is sort of a bigger, more robust, and multifaceted social vision of social transformation when people realize that the enmity is being destroyed in Christ and that he wants to build peace and oneness and unity and shalom and goodness amongst people that are at each other's throats. So I think that uh, Ephesians 2 passage is, is kind of reconciliation writ large in the, in the work of the church. But this is the one that I meant to read that I said that, that we quoted in the beginning when I first read that quote from the preface of the book of Confession 67. It said it's modestly built on one verse. And that one verse is in Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 5. Some of you know this well, I'm sure. And if at home, you can look it up in your own translation. I got an old-fashioned translation here that I'm used to. But here's, here's what 2 Corinthians 5 says. I love this. Let's start, I guess. <laughs> where, where do you start with these paragraphs? You, you want to read the whole thing. Let's start at, uh, at verse uh, 17. If anyone is in Christ... They are a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. 
Now, the Greek word there, I don't know, Kyle, you could probably speak to this better than I could, but I'm told that the Greek there, again, is not just personalistic, that you're a new creature inside your heart, but there's some new creation that's breaking in, a new reality. The kingdom of God and the lordship of Christ is transforming everything, and so you're now part of this new creation. Old things have passed away, certainly in your own life, the old enmity and racism that you once had or the anger or whatever, the addictions, they can pass away, and new things can come, and the new reality is a given, that the new are now a new creature. Okay, let's flesh that out in verse 18 that it says. Now, all these things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ. That's what these earlier verses were about. Who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us, drum roll please at home, the ministry of reconciliation. Namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the whole world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Sometimes when I quote this verse from memory, I say it too fast, and I say the work of reconciliation. The text says the word of reconciliation, but it's work too. It's a ministry, it said earlier in the earlier sentence. So it is a work, a ministry, a project, an effort, a goal, a, a, a mission, a, a, a BHAG. <laughs> it's a big, hairy, audacious goal, as they say in the business world. This is what we're committed to. This is huge. Christ has changed us. Old things are passed away. The new things include the ministry of reconciliation because God is reconciling the whole world, not counting our trespasses against us. So again, in this text at least, there's other texts about judgment, but this sounds like grace. God isn't even worried about our sins. He just wants to get on with the project of showing his love in the world, and he's giving that project to us to be agents of reconciliation. Therefore, verse 20, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were entreating through us, we beg you, world, on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Some people have reduced this to evangelism. And I think in the fall, we're even going to have an evangelism sort of specialist in here from our denomination. We're going to have a little evangelism training and so forth because evangelism, sharing the good news of the gospel in, in words, entreating in people, begging people, get right with God, is part of this mission, I think. But as we've said from this great quote that I read from the book of Confessions of the 67, as we've implied from these other texts, reconciliation is more than just evangelism and sharing the words of how you can have justification through faith in Christ and have your trespasses wiped away. That is part of it. But as we're going to look at, we'll realize that it is much more than just that. It is word and deed. It is personal salvation and corporate transformation of the society at large. One place that says that as well as any is a passage that I think anytime I'm given a mic, I, I like to highlight. It's uh, Colossians 1. Some say that this Colossians 1 uh, was maybe even a uh, praise song in the early church. We'd have it on overhead projectors and stuff if we had worship teams today. Um, but Colossians 1 is a passage that we often talk about here in this class because it talks about how Christ wants to have supremacy in all things. We've read it together before. I won't go over it again, except again in sort of the upshot of that is in Colossians 1 verse 20 where it says Christ is reconciling the world or all things to himself. So again, the text of Colossians 1 implies that all things, the whole cosmos is being redeemed. That Christ, things invisible and visible, institutions and society and personal people, both personal and corporate. You read that Colossians 1, it just over and over again sings this broad vision of social transformation that happens when reconciliation uh, happens in its broadest, most profound sense. I want to quickly shift the word from reconciliation to a word that some of us use, and I have to be careful because I don't mean to be reductionistic and narrow it down to just one thing. But again, with this broad, robust vision of social transformation that happens as we build God's shalom and become witnesses of God's reconciling work of the whole creation and of all things, as Colossians 1.20 says, one of the ways to help us just get an image of that that we're going to hear over the next couple of weeks, I think, is peacemaking. 
So let's move from reconciliation to peacemaking. It, that word is used in Confession of 67, but not as much. But I think it's helpful to just highlight a couple texts about peacemaking. You all know the Sermon on the Mount that says, blessed are the peacemakers. And sometimes, you know, we just sort of all think that's like a t-shirt cute or something, a bumper sticker. But let's face it, this is God's word. And Jesus, when he was on earth, told some stories, did some healings. He did some teaching, but not a lot. Jesus wasn't a very great lecturer. I'd give him more classes than Jesus did. Uh, he told a lot of stories. But in the few words that he did that were didactic teaching, the Sermon on the Mount, we should pay attention. When our Lord and Savior, God in the flesh, starts saying stuff like, listen to me, this is my class, this is my new commandments, we should pay attention. And one of them is the Sermon on the Mount, where he specifically says to love your enemy, where he specifically says in the Beatitudes, blessed are those who are peacemakers where he specifically says, turn the other cheek. I mean, that's hard stuff if you pay, take it seriously. And sometimes we think, oh, Jesus, it's quaint and loving, and it's kind of a general principle. Yeah, we're supposed to love people. But he specifically says that if your enemy asks you to carry something, serve them uh, by carrying it twice as far. It was sort of a revolutionary, Kyle, you preached on this, kind of a revolutionary subversive act to turn the other cheek implies the other person has to hit you again. I mean, this is almost sort of the Martin Luther King Satyagraha from Gandhi, a powerful truth force that when you love like this, it can change things. And so Jesus isn't just kind of being nice. He's got a strategy here that is an upside down kingdom of loving enemies so much so that things are transformed. In Matthew 5, there's a direct text, Matthew 5, 23, you guys know it, that says if you've got something uh, that you're mad about with your brother or sister uh, before you take communion, put your gift on the side and go make peace with them and then come back. Even communion is supposed to be reconciling, and if you've got issues with people, you're supposed to deal with it. Matthew 18 is a classic teaching of Jesus on if you've got trouble with somebody, you go to them. You don't gossip, you go to them and you try to get make right. And if something doesn't go well, you take somebody with you, a fair-minded counselor that can help reconcile, and you hear him out a second time. And so again, Jesus implies, in fact, later, they even suggest you shouldn't take people to court. I think God institutes law, and there's justices and what we would call lawyers, even in the Bible, certainly even the Old Testament. Guys like Job sat at the public square and rendered judgment. Um, so I'm not against lawyers by any stretch of the imagination. But there is this direct teaching that implies that you really should tr not be suing people. And in fact, in Corinthians, it says that quite specifically. So this notion of being a peacemaker to the extent that you're willing to go the extra mile to try to make it right with people, to bend over backwards, to even take somebody with you, to not just gossip or hold a grudge, but to try to make things right, certainly before communion. And in Matthew 18, this whole strategy for doing that, it is this constant theme in the New Testament of the oneness of Christ, the reconciling community we are, and then living that out in practical details. Uh, like the one another verses. Be kind to one another. Bear with one another. Bear one another's burdens. Uh, pray for one another. Forgive one another. All these one another instructions remind us to be people of mercy and kindness. In fact, Ephesians 4.32 just says, be kind and show forgiveness because God has shown forgiveness to you. So there again, because we have uh, been reconciled with God, we can be agents of reconciliation with others. Because we've been forgiven, we can forgive others. Because we know God's mercy, we can be people of mercy, right? In Hebrews 12, it says, uh, Pursue peace with all holiness. Pursue peace with all, with all holiness. It kind of links holiness and peacemaking. That reconcilia reconciliation is so much close to the heart of God. Uh, I think it was Allison maybe last week that said we tend to think of holiness, or maybe it was Stephanie last week said, we tend to think of holiness as things you don't do, like some churches don't play cards or don't dance or, you know, you don't smoke, which is, of course, sensible. But that holiness is sort of this purity code of things that you don't do. Where here holiness is linked to in Hebrews 12, verse 14, um, uh, uh, pursue peace, which is holiness. In fact, the only time when Jesus said, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect, is about forgiveness. That somehow the holiness of God, the heart of God, is seen so intensely in his act of reconciliation that if we want to be really holy, if we want to be godly, if we want to be godlike and in his image and really reflect Jesus, 
the heart of that is kindness towards others, particularly those that have harmed you. While we were yet his enemies, he died for us. So how do we handle our enemies? So being a peacemaker is more than just a quaint little teachings of Jesus, as seriously as we should pay attention to Jesus. It's not just sort of this simple, blessed are the peacemakers, isn't that nice? It's a mission and an identity of people who go the extra mile to be agents of reconciliation. Let me read Romans 12 to you. Sometimes people call, quote, uh, Romans 13 about obeying the government, and some people think it might even be ironic that half of Paul's people were in jail during that time. And to say that the government is good is sort of like wink, wink. Like, who possibly could believe that? And so I don't know whether you had to read Romans 13, but I do know this. Romans 13, about the government, following the government, comes right before this. Listen to this from Romans 12. And again, you could read the entire chapter, but let's just start right here. Uh, Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all people. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all people. Never take your own revenge, beloved. Leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I will repay. But if your enemy is hungry, and this is quoting the Old Testament here, if your angry enemy is hungry, feed him. And if he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not overcome evil by evil but overcome evil with good. This is the revolutionary, subversive vision that we think of when we think of Martin Luther King and the civil rights movements, nonviolent commitment to social change, the the, the sit-ins at the the lunch counters and so forth, where they allow people to harm them without fighting back, where the humiliation of caregiving was taken upon themselves but never inflicted on anyone else. They repaid evil with good. King used to say that. John Lewis said that before they marched across the bridge in Selma. Quoted this verse, that we should always overcome evil, not with other evil. Gandhi used to say, you know, eye for an eye, and then you end up with everybody blind. (laughs) We don't need more blindness. We don't, you don't put out fire with fire. You put out fire with water. And so you need something better than the hatred, and that's love. So again, this mission and obedience of following God through showing love even to enemies, of restraining yourself when you have desires for vengeance, of letting that to God, and you yourself always, if, it's a, if it depends on you, being at peace with all people. So that's some of the themes we're going to hear over the next couple of weeks as we talk about people. Again, one of my friends that we're going to have here literally is part of a group called Christian Peacemaker Teams. They go into war zones and literally risk their own lives. They say, if soldiers are willing to risk their lives for war, we're never going to stop war until peacemakers have the same courage that the soldiers do. And so Christian peacemakers teams dispatch people to the West Bank between Palestinians and Israelis. My own sister-in-law went to one in Nicaragua between the Contras and the Sandinistas, um, and, and literally willing to risk your own life. And, and if they're Westerners, chances are just quite on a practical level, the media is there and they're not going to kill you. So you can develop peace by going into the war zones. Well, Rick has been a Christian peacemaker team and has had more bullets fired at him than anybody I know. So we're going to have him here for one week. Again, it's not just like a tender little, oh, I don't like you much, but I'll, get, I'll put up with you. I'll, you know, I'll be nice. This is a radical commitment to revolutionary love that takes these texts so seriously that it begins to be agents of transformation in the world. I think that's what Confession of 67 is talking about. Examples of social change that take this stuff and allow it to even shape our politics and our culture and our, and our, and our institutional change. Well, I, like that I, go, uh, I was just going to ask. Please. We have all these sort of profiles of reconciliation. Okay, we could try to do that. Uh, we're still juggling the dates because some people can only come some dates and some people can't come. You know, yeah, any any day now. Thank you, Kyle. Thanks. We have just a couple more minutes. Um, I have a whole bunch of verses, and those in this room and most of those at home, I'm assuming, would know some of these about how this social change stuff is not just sort of my desire to say, oh, let's take reconciliation cosmic and make it political, that the Old Testament prophets did that often. You know, Isaiah 1, 
is a great passage to learn, but it says learn to do justice, re rebuke evil. You know, there's this constant theme of God's heart for justice and standing against injustice, Isaiah 1. Uh, Amos 5 says, uh, let justice roll down like a mighty river. You know that one. Micah 6, 8, love kindness, walk humbly with God, but do justice. Psalm 33, verse 5 said, God loves justice. Um, Isaiah 61 a reference to the year of Jubilee talks about the year of the favorable year of the Lord when Shalom breaks out. The swords are supposed to be knocked into plowshares. That's in both Micah and Isaiah. Uh, Jeremiah 29 talks about seeking the peace of the of the city you're in. Isaiah 58 talks about labor relations and uh, not paying your workers and stuff. There's just plenty of these kind of broad cosmic social themes in the scriptures. I'm going to end, though, by beginning this process of telling a story. And boy, I wish I had a whole hour to do this. But I wanted to get some of these biblical themes out there. Maybe we'll revisit this story another time. But I'm going to close with this quick story. It's based uh, on a book called Stronger Than Steel. If anybody wants to look at that, I think it is in the church library. Uh, my wife and I lived and worked for a Presbyterian church in the late 70s in McKeesport, Pennsylvania, which is outside of Pittsburgh. And you probably know a bit about the steel industry there all around Pittsburgh. There's foundries and stuff. And there was one in a town called Glassport. The own, company was owned by a company called Pitron. And the Pitron episode became a documentary film, which is still online, uh, called The Miracle of Pitron. There were two miracles. One was a fire where everything burned except a Bible. And there's a picture of this Bible where the molten steel went right over it and didn't burn it. It is a miracle. But the deeper miracle was that this plant was almost a, a hellhole. It was violent. There was racism. There was alcohol abuse. The men would go to the bars afterwards, mostly men. Uh, they were at each other's throat. The owners were rude. The managers wouldn't even look people in the eye. Nobody knew each other. It was an awful place to work, and productivity went down. A new manager came to town. He happened to be a Presbyterian. He went to Pleasant Hills Presbyterian Church, an evangelically-minded, vibrant Presbyterian church in South Pittsburgh. His name was Wayne Alderson, World War II hero. Wayne went in there as a manager and said, I'm going to get to know people. I'm going to call people by name. I'm going to start a Bible study. And he began a theory. He called it Theory R, which stood for respect. It became the value of the person movement. A theologian named R.C. Sproul, a conservative reform guy, a Presbyterian scholar, wrote, a book, wrote this book about Wayne, became Wayne's friend, and helped start an organization called uh, the, 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 the value of the person movement. It tried to get labor and management talking to one another uh, through aid, being agents of reconciliation. And Wayne would walk the foundry floor, inviting people, exhorting people to care for one another, to treat one another with respect. I found an interview uh, online with the 700 Club. Ben Kinslow asked him years ago when Wayne was still alive about whether this is, uh, how do you get productivity in American industry again? And he said, you don't get in uh, productivity by trying to get productivity. That's almost making it into an idol. It's not about the business making more money. It's got to be about the dignity of the person and not as a trick to help productivity, although it will help productivity, but because it's the right thing to do. And so he began this movement to bring reconciliation between the labor uh, forces, the union that hated management viciously, and the management and the management people who was incredibly uh, inappropriate to the workers. And over time, this reconciliation developed and it became a decent place to work, a safe place to work, a healthy place to work, Bible studies in the place. There was this fire and this Bible was saved and the miracle of Petron is dramatic in how the Bible was saved. But it was God's word breaking out in that place that allowed them to start a whole movement. They began to get uh, contracts from other places like the Volkswagen plant out there in New Stanton. They made rabbits, if you remember rabbits back in the day. This is all in the 1970s. They began to do negotiations at a broader scale, helping businesses reconcile labor and management. My wife and I, doing this campus ministry in those years, remember deeply how there was an awful strike between labor workers and management around the coal and steel industry. 
and there was almost like what today we'd call a shutdown. It was in the dead of winter, and there was fear that there was people were going to lose heat because the strike was going on for months. And Wayne Alderson said, the value of the person can answer this problem too. This wasn't his plan. And they formed a prayer meeting on Market Square, downtown Pittsburgh, between labor and management. And they got two people, labor and management, to embrace one another, not just shake their hands, but hug one another. This was long before Promise Keepers. Getting men to hug one another, labor and management, to show reconciliation and respect, and that this was the only thing that was going to break this awful strike that had been national headlines. Bomb threats were called in, probably from both sides. I had to talk to parents of the youth group saying we were going to go to this thing, to witness this thing, and to share our voice. People were asked to come, like a public, not a protest, but a public witness to reconciliation. And we had to realize there could be a bomb. We went anyway. Some of the kids didn't. These two guys embraced publicly, labor and management. Some of the management people thought it was just a hoax. Some of the workers, most of the workers thought it was just a trick of the management. Nobody trusted anybody. And Wayne Alderson and a guy named Lefty Samesi, an uh, Italian union guy, stood in that stage and watched other people get involved and they gave sermons and talks about the value of the person. And wouldn't you know that strike broke within a week and things got reconciled in that particular time and place. Labor management problems are not over in America. The Confession of 67 has not solved our problems. Wayne, Anderson, Wayne Alderson's value the person now carried on by his daughter, a Presbyterian leader, continues to do workshops in labor and management reconciliation. But with a Wayne Alderson story, I think this book is in our church law library, it's called The Stronger Than Steel, The Wayne Alderson Story, and it has inspiring uh, reflections of those years of that miracle at Pitron in Glassport, PA, and how it riffled out into, into other areas of steel mills and other places, including this Market Street demonstration that I was at in Pittsburgh in the late 70s. An example of a peacemaker, of a reconciler, not a person that said, let's just be nice, but let's work for actual practical transformation of the workplace and how institutions like labor and management could work together as reconciled people in the same team rather than each other's throats. This is the example of the kind of stuff we think that this class will help us all live into. Well, come on back next week. Folks at home, tune in again. Thank you for being here. We'll have the feedback on next week so people can make comments. We'll have a little more conversation time in the weeks to come as we ask questions of our guests and let them tell their stories. Thanks a lot.